worship him together and I absolutely love our going through the Bible as we are and now in the Gospels uh, we are seeing really clear pictures about Jesus Christ and who he is and so in tonight's message you're going to have to uh, hang with me and stay tight with us in this message because we have completed our study of Matthew and in tonight's message we're going to go to the book of Mark and so I want to share with you fairly quickly several things about Matthew and Mark and Luke these three books of the Gospels is sometimes referred to as the synoptic Gospels it is called that because you see in Matthew Mark and Luke the telling of the life of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus and things that Jesus said and taught and did and so the Holy Spirit of God led these men to write about Jesus and about his life upon this earth and so as you read Matthew Mark and Luke you will see the harmony of their teachings in each of these books and the majority of what we would read in Mark we have studied in Matthew and also in Luke and so what I'm going to do in this message tonight is to give to us an overview or a survey of the book of Mark and it's very interesting <clears throat> there's a lot to say and so I would ask you to uh, go fast with me tonight and if there are things that you miss that you want to write down because there's several references that you will see on the screen tonight uh, remember that this can be printed out and handed to you and so don't freak out if you miss a verse here or there uh, just ask me and we'll print these slides out for you and that's not an issue at all but stay with us tonight as we look at the writings in the book of Mark in Mark chapter 1 the Bible begins this study like this it is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God and so we begin there in chapter 1 reading about Jesus this is the writings of a young man by the name of John Mark you'll notice on the screen that his name is John Mark sometimes referred to as John because that's his Jewish name not to be confused with the John of the gospel or the John who wrote uh, first second and third John in Revelation that's a different John but this young man's name was John Mark John his Jewish name Mark being his Roman name it's a very interesting study when you study the life of Mark one of the things that we find in Scripture is that Mark was a cousin of Barnabas you'll remember Barnabas from the book of Acts because Barnabas was called uh, the great encourager and when we find someone in our church or someone among our family as believers who's a very encouraging type of person we refer to them at times as a, they are a Barnabas they are an encourager to other people and Barnabas was Mark's cousin another thing we find in the Gospels is that his mother whose also name was Mary uh, she was very active in the church of Jerusalem and it's interesting when you read in the book of Acts when Peter had been in prison and the believers met at someone's home to pray for him to be released and God did this miraculous work and Peter was released from prison he went back to the prayer meeting and they didn't have time to answer the door because they were in there praying he would be released and he was standing there at the door and uh, that house that they were praying at was Mark's mother's home so as you read on in the book of Acts you find that he was with Paul and Barnabas his cousin but the Apostle Paul and Barnabas on Paul's first missionary trip but something happened that was very sad during their trip they came to a city and Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas as you read the New Testament you discover that Paul was very upset about it Paul was angry he was not pleased at all that Mark would desert them and go back home he was very angry about it and so when it was time for them to take a second missionary trip it was Barnabas who wanted Mark to go with them 
But Paul did not want him to go with them because he had deserted them on the first trip. It became a heated debate. And it became such a heated debate between Barnabas and Paul that they split company. So you see that discussions and heated discussions didn't just happen in the church this year. It has been going on ever since there has been a church. And these two, Paul and Barnabas, got into a heated argument. And as a result, they split company. Paul took Silas with him, and Barnabas would take Mark. But I love this story of Mark, because as you read on in the New Testament, something very interesting happens. Over time, there was a change in young Mark's heart. And over time, we see Paul writing to the church in Colossae in chapter 4 and verse 10, and he told them to welcome Mark to Colossae. You also read in the book of Philemon, which is one chapter, verse 24, that Paul refers to Mark in that verse as a fellow worker. And then the great endearment verse in the Bible in reference to the life of Mark, that God had given to Mark another opportunity, and Paul had received Mark into his heart with love. It is a great picture of restoration. It is a great picture of God mending broken hearts. When the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, Paul wrote to Timothy and said to him, Bring Mark because he is useful to me for ministry. I love the story of Mark because it is a great story of God working in someone's heart and giving to them another opportunity. Many Bible scholars believe that much of the information that Mark wrote down was information that he had been given by Simon Peter. Because the writings of Mark include so many intimate details that only an eyewitness would know what was taking place in many of the statements that Mark made. And so Bible scholars believe that, the, uh, that Peter actually sat with him and gave to him inside information about what happened with the disciples and Jesus as he wrote them down. And Mark wrote beautifully about the works of Jesus. One of the things that you will notice about the writings of Mark that is a little bit different than you will find in Matthew or in Luke. And that is Mark does not get into things like the birth of Jesus. He doesn't get into the genealogy. He doesn't get into some of the things that, that Matthew and Luke got into because Mark was primarily writing to the Romans as opposed to Matthew and Luke's audience being the Jews. And so his approach in what he was saying was a little bit different than what Matthew and Luke had done. Now, one of the things as you read through the book of Mark that you're going to find, beside the name Jesus, the, the word that Mark used more than any other word in his writing was the word immediately. There's an immediacy about his writing that when God speaks to us, we should immediately respond to what he says. Immediately an action took place. And you see that over and over. He emphasizes in his writing the actions of Jesus more than he does the teachings of Jesus. When you're reading Matthew and Luke, you read a lot about what Jesus was teaching. When you read Mark, you're reading more about what Jesus did, the actions of Jesus' life. And so as you read through Mark, he presents Jesus as God's servant. Now, when we go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we just went through Matthew, and we, as we do in Mark and Luke, we watch Jesus as he teaches people, as he demonstrates who he is, as he reveals himself to man that he is God in the flesh. And all the actions of Jesus upon the earth in the flesh, the question comes up, and we've already seen it, and you're going to remember some of these things uh, as I talk about it because you've studied Matthew. But the question is, how did people respond to Jesus? I know that what you and I would say, I know that Jesus is here, and you know that Jesus is here, and we're rejoicing and we're worshiping him because we know he's in this room right now worshiping uh, with us as we worship him. He's, he's here with us. 
And, and so if I were to ask you, Jesus standing here in the flesh, how would you respond? Uh, you would probably try to guess. You know, I would probably think about, okay, would I fall on the ground and, and grab his feet like the women did after his resurrection? Would I just start shouting? Would I become Pentecostal and jump up and down and run circles around the auditorium? I don't know totally how I would respond to Jesus. But Jesus in the flesh in the first century received a lot of different reactions from people. When Jesus came, not everybody bowed down and worshipped at his feet. When Jesus came, not everybody received him. And it's important for you to see these reactions to Jesus that we're getting ready to review. And the reason it's important for you to see how people responded to Jesus in the flesh in the New Testament is because it's the same way that people are going to respond to you today. Because the Jesus who lives in you is the same Jesus that walked in the flesh in the first century. And they will treat you, Jesus in you, the same way that people treated him in the first century when he walked here in the flesh. And so he taught us in the Gospels that when people treat you this way, basically he was telling us not to take it personal because they're persecuting him. They are responding to him. Therefore, we don't take the praise for what God does through us, nor should we be totally despondent when people criticize us because of our faith in Jesus Christ. It all goes to Him. All the praise goes to Him, but listen, so does the criticism about who He is. And His shoulders are big enough to deal with it. So you have to understand that. So let's review from the New Testament again how people to Jesus and how they will respond to him in your life as a believer. For example, we see as we go through these passages in Mark that there were those indeed who believed in Jesus. Now it is our heart's desire that everyone we talk to about Jesus would receive him. The bad news is not everyone will receive Jesus, nor did everyone Jesus talked to receive him in the flesh. So remember, just like there was rejection of Jesus in the flesh, when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, there will be rejection to you, but there will also be those who will trust him. There's some examples on the screen. For example, in chapter 2 and verse 5, there were friends of a paralyzed man who believed in Jesus because of his work in the paralyzed man. There was Jairus, who was the ruler of the synagogue in chapter 5, that the scripture teaches us, responded in belief to Jesus. There was a woman with what is referred to as having an issue of blood. She had had a problem for 12 years. Uh, with this medical problem, and Jesus healed her. We see a picture of a Syrophoenician woman in chapter 7 that Jesus miraculously worked in her life, she believed. And there was the beautiful story of blind Bartimaeus that Jesus healed of his blindness, and Jesus touched him, and he believed. We saw recently in the book of Matthew when we studied the crucifixion of Jesus how that the Roman commander of a hundred men turned to Jesus at the cross seeing that Jesus really was who he said he was. And so through the Gospels, we do find that there were people who believed in Jesus. And that's pretty exciting, isn't it? I mean, when you really think about how exciting it is when someone comes to Jesus Christ, remember this, the Bible tells us that when someone repents and comes to Christ, there is rejoicing in heaven. I mean, heaven has a party. That's pretty exciting when somebody believes someone trusts in Jesus Christ. There is a party in heaven celebrating those who believe. And so we love to see people come to Christ. I have found in my life as a believer that there's nothing that gives me more encouragement. When I am discouraged or I am feeling down, there is nothing that lifts me up more or fills me with more excitement than watching someone come to know the Lord as their personal Savior. Whenever you get discouraged in life, the best thing you can do if you really 
we want to get cheered up is just start hitting the streets and trying to find someone to lead to Christ. Because when they get saved, it will help you to not be down on yourself and down on life and down on everything around you because suddenly you realize that all of heaven is rejoicing in this moment and I'm going to join with heaven in rejoicing over this one who just got saved. And so some indeed believed. But also a response that we have already seen is that there were those who were unsure some of them were even confused about who Jesus was. Because remember what we said when we studied the book of Matthew? A lot of the religious crowd had read the Old Testament. And so in the Old Testament, there's the teaching of the coming one, the king, of him coming to reign, the Messiah who would come and reign. And the disadvantage that people had pre-New Testament writings because you and I have both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So remember these folks didn't have, they couldn't go down to Lifeway and get them a Bible like you and I do, right? I mean, they didn't have New Testaments and they didn't have churches passing out Bibles. They didn't have that. And so when they would read the Old Testament and they would read about this coming Messiah, the Savior of the world, they did not have the ability to distinguish between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And you and I now understand that mystery. You and I understand the mystery between his first coming and his second coming. That in the first coming he would come as a humble servant who would die on a cross for in shame for the sins of the world. But the second time he comes, it's not as a humble servant. He's coming as the reigning king in judgment. We are privileged to know that. They didn't have the privilege we have, and some of them were really just unsure. I mean, they would be like, how could the Messiah of the world come from Nazareth? I mean, they even said, how could any good thing come from there? And they, would, they just couldn't understand that. His family couldn't understand that. His brothers could not understand that. People who lived in his neighborhood did not respect him. They did not understand how the Savior of the world could come and suffer and how he could die. All they thought was is that one day this Messiah is going to show up and he's going to get rid of the Roman Empire for us. He's going to establish a kingdom here upon the earth. That's what they were looking for. And so when Jesus came the first time as he did, there were those who were confused. There were those who were unsure about who Jesus really was. Now, I would say this about us. I pray that the message that you and I present, both in word and in the action of our lives, will not confuse the world about who Jesus is. Do you see how important it is to walk in the Spirit of God? Do you see how important it is for Jesus to live through us? Because when we live one thing and we proclaim another thing, that's confusing. I mean, you tell me that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, but you don't, your life isn't any different than mine. You tell me that Jesus Christ can save somebody and change their life, but I don't see any change in you from when you started this. And we confuse people sometimes. And so this is a challenge to all of us to not send out conflicting messages to the world about who Jesus is. That's why it is so important for us as believers to walk in the Spirit of God so they will see the real Jesus and not a conflicting message coming from our lives. So there were numerous times where they were amazed or astonished at Jesus in trying to understand Him. Now another way that Jesus was responded to, and we saw this a lot in Matthew, was that there were some who were critical, I mean flat out opposed Jesus. We read, uh, even Pilate knew that the religious leaders were jealous of Jesus, remember that? Even when he was brought to trial, Pilate could see that these religious leaders were jealous of Jesus. And so there were those who were critical of him, there were those who opposed him. And one of the things that happened in chapter 2 is that Jesus made statements like he could forgive people of their sins, that he was the bridegroom of Israel, which is a, a reference back to the Old Testament. 
that he made a statement that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. And the, and the big deal about those statements is those statements belong to God. And so when Jesus made these statements about forgiving people of their sins and being the bridegroom of Israel and the Lord of the Sabbath, he was saying, I am God. And so the religious leaders saw that as blasphemy. And so there in chapter 2 and verse 7, we find that they charged him with blasphemy because of those statements. Another criticism that Jesus received, as a matter of fact, they called him Beelzebub, chief of the devil. They called him a, a wine-bibber, yet he lived the most uh, regulated of lives. They called him all kinds of names. They called him an illegitimate child, though he was born of the Virgin Mary. And one of the criticisms of Jesus was that he was criticized for eating with sinners. Now, I, I, I think it's a compliment. And I think it's wonderful that Jesus was willing to get around sinners. I, I'm glad he came to me, aren't you? And I don't understand the criticism that he ate with sinners. But I think it's a great, great criticism of him because it shows the kind of Savior he is. But he was criticized for who he was. Let me show you another critical statement that maybe you have not noticed before. When you look in chapter 3 and verse 21, his family thought he lost his mind. I've not heard through the years a lot of people bring that fact out. But when you read chapter 3 and verse 21, he had family members that thought he was crazy. That he had lost his mind. We also find in chapter 3 that the teachers of the law thought that he was demon-possessed. They referred to him as Beelzebub, chief of the devils. The Gerasenes, and this is when, you remember, there were a, a, a man demon-possessed, and Jesus approached this man and asked him who he was, and the man said, I, and the voice said, I am legion, for there are many of us. And you remember that, that this man was just totally demon-possessed. And the demons began to speak to Jesus because they knew who Jesus was. And they begged him. They begged Jesus. And he, he freed the man from the demons, allowed them to go into the pigs, and they ran off and drowned. Remember that story? And so when the, the neighborhood, the Gerasenes, had seen this, the Scripture says that they were so afraid of Jesus because they had seen this happen. And instead of that causing them to respond to Jesus in faith, it actually caused them to be afraid of Jesus to the point where they asked him to leave the area and to leave the region. When we come to chapter 6, we find that his hometown was offended by Jesus. We also find that King Herod was worried about him and that the Pharisees continued to challenge Jesus. And we saw that numerous times when we studied Matthew. Now, one of the things I loved about all of these challenges that the religious crowd brought was that no matter how hard they tried, they could never trap Jesus. And I love to read these cases where these people would come and try to trick Jesus with questions. And he always turned it around, and he always won those debates. They just could not trap him. He was a master and, and was amazing in the way he responded. So with that in mind, the question now comes up. We know how they responded to Jesus with criticism, opposition, some were confused, some were just not sure, but there were those who believed. So the question that is now begging us is this, so then who is Jesus? This is one of the exciting things that we find in the Gospels, is that the Word of God teaches us who Jesus really is. And it's important that you hear what the Word of God says about Jesus. Because in your life, you're going to hear from many religions. You're going to hear from Islam. You're going to hear teachings perhaps from Buddha. You're going to perhaps hear teachings about Hinduism. Uh, you may hear some kind of New Age movement teaching. You may hear some kind of teaching uh, about Mormonism. Or you may hear teachings from all kinds of different religions in the world. 
And so the question comes up, who is Jesus? And the significance of that is that, let me put this in a little bit of a technical term for just a moment and I'll explain it. All the religions of the world are referred to as subjective faiths. In other words, the validity of the religions of the world are dependent upon the subjects of that religion. That is why in Islam, people are willing to die for their faith is because they're trying to prove that their faith is real. Christianity is the only religion that is not a subjective religion. In other words, Christianity is not dependent on us making Christianity valid. Christianity is referred to as an objective faith. In other words, what makes Christianity valid is the object of our faith. And so the importance of knowing who Jesus is is that it's what our faith is about, the object of our worship, the object of our faith. You see, you can have faith in a lot of things, but the question is, who do you have your faith in? You know, there's kids who have faith in Santa Claus. I, I don't lie to our kids, our grandkids. I don't lie to them. I tell them the truth. I was talking to my grandson this past weekend about Santa Claus. And, and I said, Santa Claus isn't real. That's just pretend. He said, Santa's not real. No, son. That we, that's just something we play. You know, I'm honest with them. I'm not, I don't want them to believe these fairy tales. I want them to know that certain things are play, but Jesus Christ is real. He is the object of our faith. And so whether or not Christianity is valid depends on if Jesus Christ really is who he says he is. That's the bottom line. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is? That's what makes Christianity valid. What makes Christianity valid is not whether or not I'm a hypocrite. It's not whether or not our church has hypocrites that attend here. And for those of you who say, I don't go to church somewhere because it's full of hypocrites, listen, that is not what Christianity is based on. Christianity is not based on how the church members live. It's based on the object of our faith and worship, Jesus Christ. And so if Jesus Christ really is who he says he is, then that's where you need to put your faith not in how I live, not in how somebody in the church lives. The question is, is Jesus Christ who he says he is? And if he is indeed who he says he is, then you must put your faith and trust in him. And so what does the Bible say about Jesus Christ? I love this, and please write this down, because here's what we learn uh, about Jesus as we go through this section. And Jesus refers to Psalm 110 when he describes himself as David's greater son. He is the Lord. He is David's greater son as read about in Psalm 110. Jesus also referred to himself from Isaiah 53 when the Bible describes the one who would come in rejection and suffering. The Bible also says that Jesus refers to Daniel chapter 7 that teaches that he will return in judgment. So what do we learn about Jesus just based on what Jesus said about himself? It is this, three things. Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, according to the Bible and according to his own words, is God in the flesh. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, he came as God in the flesh. Remember that the Bible, and you've heard me say this many times, defining the Bible, and it's important that you remember this. The Bible, the Word of God, is God's revelation of himself to man. So when you read the Bible, what you're reading is God revealing to us who he is so that we can know who he is and our need for him. And to point out to us our, our need. Now, remember that the Bible is not an exhaustive book about God. This book cannot contain everything there is to know about God. There's not enough space in the universe. If you stack books up, the universe could not hold the books that would talk about the greatness of God and who He is and the nature of God. So what God did, knowing that that couldn't happen, God gave to us enough information in this book called the Bible 
that we can learn enough about him to know who he is and to know our need for him and his desire for us so that we would turn to him and walk with him. And so the Bible reveals to us that he, Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. We also discover in Jesus Christ that he was rejected and he suffered on the cross for our sins. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh? That's important because he was sinless. And without a human being being sinless, there was no way any of us could have someone to take care of our sin debt. And so we need to believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, sinless God in the flesh, who came to take our sins upon himself. Do you believe he was God in the flesh? Absolutely. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was rejected? No question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, when he died upon the cross, took our sins upon himself as a payment to God for the debt that we owed? Because it was God that we sinned against. And so it's God that we owe. Because sin is us sinning against God. It is us offending a holy, righteous God. And this holy, righteous God that you and I have offended has within His judgment as God that the only way that our debt that we owe for offending Him could be paid would be for us to burn in hell for eternity or else someone like us without sin taking our punishment for us. And there's no one that could do that because the Bible says we've all sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God. And God, knowing that, said, okay, I will take upon myself human flesh and I will be the substitute for them. And so not only was Jesus Christ God in the flesh, sinless, he was rejected, and when he died on the cross, all of our sins was placed upon him. He died, he rose from the grave, he's alive, he is the savior of the world, he's victorious over death, he's victorious over Satan, he's victorious over sin, he's victorious over all the bondage that is in our lives, he is risen, he's alive, he's the savior. That's who Jesus is. Amen. And not only has he done that, he also reminds us as he quotes from Daniel chapter 7 that he is the king of kings who shall return to this earth in judgment. And so the gospels in the Bible teaches us who Jesus is. That's who Jesus is for us. And for that, we praise him. Now, the good news about all of that means that we now know who he is, and why he came to this earth. I love this verse in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, which Bible scholars who studied the entire book of Mark in detail believe that Mark 10, 45 is probably the key verse in all of the book of Mark. And the reason it's the key verse to Mark is because it explains to us who Jesus is and why he came to this earth. Here, if you've not heard anything else I've said, hear this. The Bible says, for even the Son of Man, Jesus, that's Jesus, for even the Son of Man came not to be served. He came as a servant the first time. He came not to be served, but to serve. How did he serve? He served by dying on the cross for our sins. That's how he served, by going to the cross and taking all of our sins upon himself. The Bible says that's why he came. And so now you know who he is, and now that you know why he came to the earth in the first century, and now you know that he's coming again to deal in judgment for those who have not received him as Lord and Savior and forgiver of our sins. He came to serve and to give, listen to that, to give his life as a ransom for many. That's who he is. That's why he came. And that's why you and I are here to worship him tonight. Is because he's our Savior. And he's our Lord, and he has saved us. 
God in the flesh. I mean, will we ever get over that? That God was willing to do that for me. I know this week while I was praying and, and I was just praying to the Lord and, and, I, and I was trying to worship God in my prayer and, 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 and as if I was in heaven trying to, I, I try not to visualize Jesus by the way when I pray and I encourage you not to do that because if you, when you're praying and you're trying to visualize Him, it's really easy for you to build up false images as the Bible teaches you not to do that. And so what I focus on when I'm praying is not trying to figure out what Jesus looks like. Don't do that. That's not a good practice. What I do when I'm praying is I just try to focus on Him. Not trying to figure out what He looks like. Does He look like that picture that hung in my granny's house? No, I don't do that stuff. You, you can really build up false images that way. Don't do that. Just focus on Him. Just focus on praying to Him. And, and as I was praying this week and just trying to focus on Him in prayer in heaven, and, and I, I was focusing on what I had read in the Bible about that throne of God and the glory of God that's described that God is so pure and God is so holy and righteous that His light, He just emanates light. I mean, picture that. He just emanates this beautiful light because He's so pure and so holy. And the Bible describes the throne of God in the, in the book of Revelation as God's throne and there's a rainbow around the throne. And there are these creatures flying around constantly saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And I was praying to God and just that that sense of the awesomeness of God in His holiness and the countenance that is so glorious that He, he is just emanates light because He's so holy. And we worship Him. And to think that He, He would walk out of that scene and take upon Himself human flesh and die in the Middle East in the first century with just tremendous brutality placed upon him. He did that for me. I can't fathom that. I can't understand it. I, I know that I live and take every breath by the grace of God. I know that. And I'm so thankful for who Jesus is and why he came to this earth. And if you're listening to this message, whether you're in the auditorium or watching the message or listening on the radio, and there's never been a time in your life where you've really understood this. And maybe in this moment, you, you've suddenly realized, hey, you know, I realize now that, that I've offended a holy God. I, by my sins, have offended a God who is so pure and so holy that His life just emanates light. I've offended Him. And I deserve to die and go to hell. I deserve to burn in eternity because I've offended holy God. But He was willing to take upon Himself human flesh and take all of my sins and my punishment upon Himself. This God must really love me. This God must really care about me. I want to give Him my life. I want forgiveness. I want to receive the holiness that He offers to me so that I can be in His presence. Because without the holiness that He gives to me, I can never make myself holy enough to enter into His presence. And so, I know that He will give me that holiness if I'll just trust Him. And I'll trust Him as my Savior. He'll place inside of me His righteousness and His holiness so that I can come into His presence and worship Him. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's who Jesus is. That's why He came. And right now, let's bow in prayer. And if you've never trusted Him as your own Lord and Savior, and you've never received what He's offering to you tonight, and that is forgiveness of your sins, and to place Himself inside of your life, giving you eternal life, and the opportunity to enter into the presence of Holy God, why don't you just say, Jesus, I... I may not understand everything there is to know in the Bible, but I do understand this. I have sinned against a holy God, and I do want forgiveness. I do want a new life. 
I do want the life that you offer to me because I'd love to be in the presence of holy God for all eternity. I receive your gift right now into my life in the best way that I know how. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand now. We're going to sing a song. David's going to lead us.